Can we stand for the reading of God's word? This morning we'll be in Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. And it, there once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each <clears throat> on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a huge a hedge around him, around the household, and all that he has on every side? Have you blessed the work of his hands and possessions, and have increased in the land? But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. So we all know the reality of the hardship and crisis. We have, we've all seen, and mo most of us, have experienced some of these obvious tragedies that stalk those who live in this world. There's a conflict all around us that we can plainly see. Death, disease, warfare, hardships, pain, sorrow, etc. are all obvious, clearly seen by everyone and experienced by all of us. But there is an area of conflict that goes, goes on around us and within us that we can't see. And I'm referring to the conflict that happens in the spiritual world. We are all engaged in spiritual warfare, even if we do not realize it. This war that cannot be seen, there are many casualties. There are no conscientious objectors. There are only those who are ground up and broken down by the spiritual crisis they face in day-to-day -day life. In this scripture, the veil is pulled back just a little bit so that we can see a little bit of the spiritual warfare that occurred in Job's life. We're allowed to see and understand a little of what transpired behind the scenes in the greatest tragedy of Job's life. In this scripture, we're allowed to see events that occurred in heaven. Imagine what a difference it would have made in Job's life if he had known what was happening, but he didn't, and neither do we. When trials come our way, it's easy to forget that God is behind our hurts and that he has a plan for us. This passage reminds us that the, of that great truth. We'll take another look at Job's great time of suffering. I want to help us learn from the warfare that Job faced. There is help for us in <clears throat> when we face 
our own times of suffering. There is help here for those times when our enemies are arranged against, arrayed against us, and there, <coughs> there is help if we will hear it and if we will receive it. We can look at the invisible war. I want, I want to share a few thoughts that present themselves in this passage. As I preach these things today, please remember that just like Job, we are engaged in a battle with a spiritual enemy who seeks our destruction, but like Job, we have one with us who is able to strengthen us. Job was an unlikely candidate. He was a man of purity, integrity, and holiness. He was a man who lived his life in fear of the Lord. He was a man against whom no one could make an accusation that would stick. He was a wealth, wealthy man, he had, <clears throat> and he was blessed. The Lord had honored Job by giving him the great riches and a large, loving family. His blessings, the blessings of God, were clearly apparent in his life. Job served as a family priest. He loved his children and he prayed for them, offering sacrifices to temporarily atone for their sins. Job was a man committed to the Lord and to his family. Job wasn't a part-time believer. He lived his, <coughs> his, this way every day of his life. Every day he spent in holy living, in avoiding sin, in seeking God and others, God for others, and in living out his relationship with his Lord. All these things make Job an unlikely candidate for the kind of suffering that he went through. Most people have the idea that we suffer for wrongdoing. That's surely what Job's wife thought and his three friends when they came. I'm sure we all know the story when, when the friends came to console Job. In, in, verse, um, in Job 2.9, his wife says to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And <clears throat> Eliphaz says, remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen those who plow in equity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. And Bilidad, how long will, your, will you speak these things, and the words of your mouth be like strong wind? Does God subvert judgment? Or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgressions. If you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place. The fact is, sometimes we do suffer because of our sins and our foolish decisions. Sometimes we suffer because Others sin and make foolish decisions <coughs> and we're caught up in their ignorance. Sometimes God will send suffering to test and grow our faith. Sometimes he allows, allows it to come to sanctify our lives. The greatest reason we suffer is for the glory of God. In John 9, 1 to 3, he tells us, Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned that this man, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither. This man nor his parents sinned, but the works of God should be revealed in him. And then in, the, in 11, John 11, 3 and 4, in the story of Lazarus, we're told, So the, the sisters sent a word to him, saying, Lord, Behold, he who you, who you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. This reminds us that no one is immune to suffering. 
No, no one in this world is above the hurts and problems that come our way. One truth we should take away from the book of Job is that there stands the tallest, <coughs> is that the tallest tree in the forest is the most likely to get hit by lightning. When you're dedicated to the Lord, to His will, and to His work, you are a candidate for pain and suffering. You are more likely to be attacked when you live closer to the Lord than you are if you are living for Him, contrary to popular belief. While Job is living his life out <clears throat> on the earth, events are taking place in heaven, events that Job can't see and is not privy to. The same conflict still goes on today. <clears throat> A heavenly assembly. This, the angelic beings make appearances before God's throne. Apparently, they're there to give an account of their service to Him. We certainly do not understand all that is taking place, but we can be mystified by the appearance of Satan. Satan is being... The being within whom sin originated appears before the Lord. Satan, the most ungodly being in the universe, stands before God himself. This is an incredible statement. After all, um, God is so holy that he can't even look on sin. Yet there stands Satan. Think about who we are dealing with here. He is called many names in the Bible. Accuser of the brethren, adversary, angel of the bottomless pit, angel, <coughs> anarchist, Beelzebub, belief, devil of the, the dragon. We, we know all the names. Yet, there he stands in the presence of the Lord in heaven. There will come a day when he will be cast out forever, as we're told in Revelations 12. Not only does Satan appear in heaven, but his presence there is acknowledged by God. God calls him to account for his activities. I don't want to get bogged down in his thought, but keep in mind, the devil is a created being. His authority and power are limited to the sovereign authority of Almighty God. You, <clears throat> you will notice who speaks first. In verse 1, 1 7, and 2-2, two, two. you will notice who speaks last. You will notice who leaves heaven when the conversation has ended. When Satan is asked about Job, Satan reveals his true identity. He lives up to his name. The word Satan means the adversary, the one who stands in opposition to another. Satan tells the Lord that the only reason Job serves him is because God is has paid him. He says that if God were removed, were to remove his hand from Job's life, Job would turn back on the, turn his back on the Lord. It's quite an accusation from an from an accuser. Did you know that Satan is still standing against the people of God? We see it more every day, don't we? Did you know that he still accuses you and me? of sin before the throne of the Lord. One man said that Satan was like the, the grave digger because he always trying to dig up dirt on the saints. <laughs> he is the accuser of the brethren in Revelations 12.10, but even in the face of this accusation, the saints of God have an advocate. Satan acts the part of the prosecuting attorney. He exposes our weaknesses and our weaknesses before God. And most of the time, he doesn't have to make anything up. Even while he accuses us before God, we have one who pleads our case. His name is Jesus. In 1 John 2, 1, he says, My, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. As much as he can, Satan unleashes hell in Job's life. In one incredible, heartbreaking, and unbelievable day, Job saw nearly everything he loved and lived for taken away. 
as this crisis in Job's life unfolds, he, he hears the theft and destruction of everything he's worked for his whole life to accomplish. This crisis is total and it's devastating. Job is ripped from his perch atop the pinnacle of success and he finds himself broken and battered with nothing left of his former life. Just when Job thinks things can't get any worse, the devastating news of all reaches his ears and he ripped his heart from his chest. He was told that all ten of his children were killed in one instance. Is it a mere coincidence that in each case only one servant was left to go and bring the news to Job? It's no coincidence. Satan spared one out of each incident so that they could do, go and push the dagger a little deeper into Job's heart. Each time a messenger came, came to Job, Satan just knew that he would break. When, when the wealth was gone, Satan turned his, his attack upon Job's children. They were ripped from life. <clears throat> And one went to tell the grieving father. Satan knew that this would surely drive Job over the edge. That was the devil's entire purpose. He wanted to get Job to curse the Lord so that he could steal God's glory. This whole episode has nothing to do with Job's wealth or with his children. The whole episode is centered around Satan's desire to rob God of his glory. When Satan did not realize what was what was that even he had the scheme were all a part of God's plan to increase his glory through his work in Job's life. That is why God took ownership of this entire affair. In Job 2.3, Satan thought that it was all him. All along, however, it had been the Lord. In, in 2.3 of Job, he says, then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, the, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still holds fast to his integrity, although you incite me against him to destroy him without cause. Job is on the earth, totally oblivious to the events taking place in heaven. God is listening to Satan attacking the servant of the Lord. Satan appears to be holding all the cards. In fact, after this little dialogue is over, Satan will unleash the fury of hell upon old Job. But I want you to know that every part of this, God exercised sovereign control over every event. God even took credit for everything that the devil did in Job 2, 3. You know, some people have a problem with the, the sovereignty of God, but I would like, I, I would have a problem if he didn't have control of it all. One of the most terrifying thoughts is that something might happen in your life or mine that God did not allow or didn't know about. He controls the situation. Satan did not speak until, the first, until he was first spoken to. God is the one who opened the dialogue with the devil. God is the one who initiated this entire episode. God is the one who brought Job into the conversation. It would seem from the conversation that Satan knew about Job, but it was God who introduced Job to his life in this instance. God was the inhibitor. Again, after Satan <clears throat> insinuates that Job will turn on God if he is properly threatened, and God gives Satan permission to attack Job, God sets limits on how far Satan can go. I want to emphasize the truth that God is in control of this entire situation. God started the dialogue with Satan. God brought Job's name up in the conversation and pointed out how spiritual and special Job was. 
God then established all the ground rules for the situation from the beginning to the end. That ought to comfort our hearts. <clears throat> As I have said before, nothing happens in your life or mine that is not part of his perfect plan for our lives. He controls the timing of our disruptions. He controls the duration of our disruptions. And he controls the extent of our disruptions. Everything he allows in our lives is for, for good and for his glory. In Romans 8, 28 and 29, we're told, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. For whom? He foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I know some people have trouble believing that, but it is a fact. Nonetheless, I find great peace in the knowledge that everything that comes my way is a part of God's plan. Now, you can have your accidents, your bad luck, and your mistakes. As for me... I'll rest my arms of the divine providence and rejoice that my God is in control of my life. In the aftermath of devastation, destruction, and death, Job still had a testimony for the Lord. The testimony served to glorify the Lord more than anything Job had done previously. A few moments of Job's life that are captured in the last verses did more to glorify the Lord than ever every sacrifice Job had offered. Job sh <clears throat> shaved his head and tore his clothes. Both of these actions are signs of intense mourning. Surely his heart was broken and un that's understandable that he would allow his grief and pain to find expression in his life. But the things that Job did make all the sense in the world to me. But the next thing Job did, did is what takes us by surprise. We're not surprised that Job grieved, that he shaved his head or tore his clothes, or that he fell down on the ground, but we are surprised that Job, surprised that Job worshipped. In all of his pain, he continued to worship. And the moment when his the <clears throat> world had crumbled to the ground at his feet. Job turned away from his problems, his pain, and his ten children to look into the face of God. He loved more than his life, more than his wealth, and more than his family. What Job, Job did, the grace of God can enable each of us to do. When Job does speak, he does not attack the Lord. When Job does speak, he offers praise to the Lord for the blessings he has enjoyed. Job has not words of con condemnation, only words of exaltation. He praises God for being God and trusts him to do right. Job's response is to submit to the will of God for his life. Job's response is to trust the Lord regardless of what his eyes have seen and his heart feels. Job's response is to keep walking in the bad times with his faith in the same God he served in the good times. What a lesson for us. Instead of griping, complaining, and even quitting on the Lord because of things don't go our way, maybe we should take a, a page from Job's playbook. Maybe we should bow to his authority and simply trust him to do right. Job understands that everything he ever had came to him from the hand of God. He knows that all his wealth, his health, his family, all the things were gracious gifts of God. As Paul would say many years later, Job understood that he was, understood what he was, and he had by the grace of God in 1 Corinthians 15.10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me has, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. That's what, comes down, come, what it comes down to for every one of us. 
There's an invisible war being raged around us today. Far too often we are casualties of that war. And we are not even aware of it. Satan attacks us from, in many ways, but his ultimate goal is always the same. He wants to undermine our faith so that he can attack the glory of God. What should our response be? We should just keep walking with the Lord. In spite of what happens to us, we should keep praising the Lord even when our hearts are broken. We should keep trusting in the Lord even when life takes, makes absolutely no sense to, to us at all. That's the lesson from Job's life. And with that, can we stand for a closing hymn?